Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, professors, TAs, uh, lovely friends. Today, uh, we are team the team Night Walker, uh, going to walk you through our project, uh, the robot dartboard. Uh, introducing ourselves quickly, uh, we have Andrew, Connie, Zach, who is out uh, joining us virtually because he's down with COVID, and me, Saha. And uh, we're going to be talking about the project uh, that we've taken up as a challenge. So to, to summarize our project in a few words, we're doing a social history uh, uh, project. And we'll get into more details, but what is the speciality? What is it that's distinguishing uh, what we're trying to do over here? Uh, before we dive into the cause of development, just walking you quickly through what we're going to cover uh, in, in the uh, slides. We're going to first going to motivate the use case and what requirements it elicits. We're then going to look at the trade studies, which makes it very clear why we made specific choices. And also, it will lay the foundations for choices we make in the future in the hardware and in the software. We then will be looking at the architectures, the functional architecture, which is way more detailed and nuanced compared to the last one we had shown. And we're going to show how this embeds into the site of skill architecture. We then going to take components of this into the work breakdown structure. And we're going to show how it's scheduling it into specific milestones. Ultimately, we're going to show that this is filled with risks and how we plan to strategize and mitigate those risks. So let's, let me walk you through the use case. I want you to visualize what's going on over here. Um, a first responder personal team, uh, the FRP, has gotten this call that a specific place on uh, disaster. It may be earthquake, nuclear, gas leak, fire. The, the, the site is, is filled with uh, dangers and hazards due to uh, maybe uh, debris, due to narrow spaces, due to spaces which are unreversible by humans. So the operator goes inside and the robot takes care of itself and follows the operator inside. The operator halts because they are unable to enter a place which has uh, terrain, which has uh, objects, which, are, which will crumble under human weight. Here, the operator deploys the, uh, the quadruped robot. <coughs> the quadruped robot is deployed inside and tries to conduct this exploration autonomously uh, for the entire area. The focus is over here, and we'll keep focus, reminding you again and again of the focuses is that the corporate should be able to explore the area in using a very uh, smart strategy. It should take, take maximum advantage of its mobility capabilities. It should be able to step over the debris which humans would not be able to step over because of the crumble. <coughs> it should also be able to navigate through small spaces and narrow entrances where I have high level of maneuverability. Ultimately, because the goal of a project is mitigating the risk that is entailed to the first, uh, the first responders, we want them the robot to like visualize the, the, uh, the, the terrain inside and get the locations of the humans which have been trapped inside. Let's take our use case and now look at the functional uh, requirements. Here again, we're going to keep reiterating the emphasis of our project. The emphasis first is the autonomous uh, exploration and planning. We have, like, let's take one example. If you have a location that you want to reach, you have to locate it that there's some, some interesting point, some distance away. You can either uh, plan a free path, which is way around and like down minded, or you could, there, there's some debris separating you, you could walk over them. This is what we want our robot to be able to gauge whether it's able to walk through it, would it slip, will it fall, if it is it too difficult, if the foothold score too high, or should it actually be able to traverse it and do this exploration in as good time as possible. Now, uh, we've already talked about the efficient and smart exploration, but we also want to talk about more specific cases, which is the robustness, the mobility, and the maneuverability. If, let's say, there is no free path available, there's no good path available, the, the, one, the, the only path available maybe is uh, a narrow entrance, a small corridor, a small space. We want to test our robot, to force the robot in such a situation, and demonstrate that it's able to actually traverse that area. And also, debris. If there's a lot of debris on the space and we, we force a robot to traverse over it, we, we want to demonstrate that the robot is able to do that. Ultimately, the underlying theme of our project, the reason we did a project, is to save lives. Uh, we will be visualizing the, the humans detected by our uh, detection algorithm and we're visualizing it to the operator in real time. Now we look at the performance requirements. The same requirements that we have spoken about, we're now going to quantify it and evaluate our own performance against this. We look at the autonomous exploration, which is in terms of the uh, coverage rate. We look at the maneuverability. The idea over here is that we want a robot to be good enough to operate in certain areas. The uh, uh, standard 
area, the easy goal for us is that she are we able to operate the rope launch, which has a door of uh, the reference length given. But our uh, desirable goal is that it should be able to operate in a more realistic uh, arena, which is the Hawkins Hospital, which we have visited, which has a much narrower uh, door size uh, given to you. Uh, uh, besides this, we want a robot to be also able to walk over the debris, which you have told you about. Now the um, interesting part over here is that since we're using, we're focusing completely on the leg robot, we don't have to restrict ourselves to like dummy goals. We can actually test our robot with debris, which is actual uh, material which you'll find in, in fact these disaster areas like earthquakes and all of these terrains. Uh, we do want to test our uh, project our uh, uh, robot against these uh, specific setup, uh, which be like randomly organized bricks and other sort of uh, waste items and force the robot to, to traverse them and demonstrate that it's able to do that. And ultimately, we want the robot to be able to detect humans in quickly and uh, with a high recall rate. We now move on to the non-functional requirements. Here, we, we distinguish, uh, reminding you of the distinction and giving you a little uh, of a spoiler uh, from the phase study, the battery life that's important to us. Why can't we do the same thing with a drone inside the disaster areas? Because the drone will run out of battery. We want the robot to be able to follow the operator for each of the sites that they get stuck and they're not able to uh, explore them. And we want the robot to actually do it and uh, be at the disposal. The battery life is extremely important to us. <coughs> Besides this, we want uh, standard uh, uh, capabilities that the robot is able to uh, adhere to and deliver uh, as required, including the compute, the failure handling, it should be able to recall as soon as the operator asks them to. It should be uh, set the physical constraints, it should be small size for small spaces, and um, there should be extensibility and the real-time visualization. We next move on to the desirable function of uh, functional or uh, non-functional requirements. The first one is the cost. So for the cost, we have this budget of MRSD of $5,000, and uh, we were, uh, we have decided after the train studies that we want to go with a corporate robot. Let me give you a few figures. Sports robot has a cost of 80,000 USD, which is not, not even including the developer API package, which is something that's integral to us. That's out of the picture. Then we have the Unity robot, which we, we uh, reached out to see its team, and the developer's API version, educational version, is uh, 15K, again outside our, our budget. We, we negotiated with them and brought it down to 6K. So uh, we have reached this desirable function of a requirement already uh, to a pretty close extent. And we'll be funded partially by the Air Lab, and we'll be using all of our MRSD budget for the uh, uh, purchase of the robot. This is something that will come up again in the risk mitigation at the end. And uh, to just quite some questions, we'll also be getting a payload, the sensor and compute payload from the Air Lab. So that's an off-cost requirement which we have already uh, met to a great extent. Apart from this, there are the standard requirements which are uh, relevant for the disaster sites which include the weight, the portability, because you want it to be deployed quickly when it's being tra tra uh, transported to the area, and then, I'm reminding you, it should be able to take care of itself, which is why we're not very keen on a rover, we're keen on a leg robot. There is the user uh, hazard, it should not be uh, dangerous for the operator himself or herself, and uh, it should be tenderless because it's out there, and color, because it should be easy to be detected in case of human strap and it's, it sees this uh, ray of hope. Now, we move on to the trace studies uh, with Zach with El Halak Elephant. Oh. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, sorry I cannot be there with you guys tonight, but feel free to interrupt me if I'm not audible. So, for the system level trace studies for our project, um, our goal here is to be informed on all the trade offs among all the different robot rescue approaches so that we compare the human teleoperate options and the ones that run us autonomously. Uh, for this two fold comparison, we further break it down into th three types of mobile platform that is available to us. And then, as you can see in the weighted sum evaluation below, we prioritize the total cost and availability to us. And then on top of it, search efficiency during exploration. And then the most importantly, the mobile versatility on different terrains in the environment. So basically, this study helped us to narrow down our choices to the leg robot platform specifically, and then which leads to our next subsystem level trip study. So for our leg robot, um, 
to choose the best select platform for our project, we mostly investigate three offset options. They are Boston Dynamics Spot, Unitary Golan EDU version, and then the Diablo. The Spot and Golan EDU are pure friendship grade robots, while the Diablo is a two-wheel light self-balancing robot, which has just become available in the market. So on top of the cost, availability, and terrain adaptation ability, uh, we prioritize uh, maneuverability parameters such as minimal turning and radius uh, to make sure that the robot will be able to navigate around narrow spaces. Uh, for, uh, from a development point, point of view for us, we give the hardware and software extensibility the biggest weight, which is a 0 0.20 weight. Uh, this aims to uh, help us have more flexibility when we need to make design changes. So based on the weighted sums that we um, we decided to go with the Unitree Go Unitree Go Go One robot that we currently in the progress of purchasing this robot, and then specifically in terms of the software architecture, we right now only have some preliminary results on the phone architecture. Um, we mostly investigated three of the following algorithms. And then this is something that we narrowed down by comparing a lot of the lighter term and the visual term. The reason why we try to do this lighter term is because these terms may introduce larger drift and they compromise the robustness in our indoor use case. In addition to the algorithm performance, we also leverage the usability of their, their code bases and then the compatibility to our Unitree GoBoy robot. Uh, since our robot has IMU, and then the fact that uh, motion constraint LiDAR geometry is most likely to outperform the LIGO one, which is a brown optimized pure scan matching algorithm, and then the LBI SAM, which involves a monocular camera. Um, then, and then we narrow down to the choice of the LiDAR inertial geometry SAM, which is the, our current best educated guess. And then in the next part, Andrew will talk about the high level scopes of our project. Thank you, Zach, for the uh, trace studies. So um, referring back to Saha's trace study and what we've envisioned, here's what we envision our robot does. The robot operates in a cluttered area, and the robot passes through narrow corridors, which is in the use case story. And the robot also looks for people stranded inside the room. That's our main objective. And once detected, it pins down the human location inside the map. And having these features in hand, the robot then sends the message the operator. The rescuers then know which rooms the people are stranded, and they also avoid potential hazards along the way when they are finding them. So if, and also if the robot is stranded, it allows the operator to manually control itself. So what I described in the previous slide transformed into the functional architecture right shown here. And the top two rows are related to traversing in the environment. The third and fourth rows detect and localize the stranded humans, and the last role connects user inputs to the systems. And so the cyber physical architecture is created to realize the methods achieving the functional architecture nodes. And it is broken down into eight parts, where the major blocks are the elevation mapping, um, the state estimator, the planning node, and the human detection node. And I'll go over them in the next few slides. The first thing we do is to make sure the robot covers enough area before it's too late for the stranded humans. The robot has to map and localize itself since there is no prior map provided. It should also be able to plan itself and generate a path to places where the doors are open. And by setting that limitation, we don't have to deal with manipulation. And the autonomous navigation feature allows a voice communication issues with the operators and enables faster response times for decisions. And um, given that we operate in cluttered and narrow environments, we now dive into how the robot navigates uh, after mapping and localizing itself in the map. So one of the most crucial criteria of the mobile robot is its ability to localize itself. If a map is not present, it, do, it must do so simultaneously. The state estimator takes in camera image, 3D LiDAR, and IMU data as inputs and sends out an updated 3D map and a robot pose in the map. 
And the greatest advantage that Agile robots have over movers is their mobility. This is achieved by expanding their traversable configuration spaces. And to find those spaces, the robot senses the terrain information and creates a local cost map, which is a geometric interpretation of how feasible it is to pass through debris. We also added the safety ultrasound feature in case the depth cameras fail to detect near objects and to avoid robot crashing. And given the local cost map, the 3D roadmap, and the robot pose, the robot then plans for its next feasible action and moves to that position accordingly. And Unitree Robot actually they provide us the control API, so our primary work here will be in the path planners instead of the motion planner and the actuators. And given its mobility, it may choose to walk over the obstacle or take a detour. And the robot keeps moving until the people stranded are found or the operation exceeds time limit. The second, second thing we're doing here is that we're finding the objects of interest. In this case, are the stranded humans. The information is only useful if the rescuers know where the humans are in the map. So we also have to localize them. The localization part has been covered by previous slides and we'll focus on the perception of human data right here. And we had a call with our previous cohort, um, Team Howley. They've done a terrific job on human detection and agreed to share their training data set with us. And however, but the IR human detector only gives out the bounding boxes of the humans detected. And we will have to align those bounding boxes with the depth images to get the human pose in the robot brain. And that will be our focus for the perception step. With the robot pose calculated from the state estimator, it can perform coordinate transform and project the human pose onto the map. It, it is also useful to label the detected human in the video so that the operator can double check whether it is needed to correct. <coughs> it is indeed a correct detection. And the third thing we are introducing is the human robot interface. In our previous presentations, we mentioned that rescue operations are done by human, so we want to allow users to interact with our robot. The robot takes control inputs from the first responders, which is the operator, and the robot also visualizes its knowledge and passes on to the operators. And the HRI part is divided into two uh, disjoint components. One is the accepting user inputs, and the second is the visualization of collected data. So the robot accepts user instructions and pass it to the teleoperation node. It bypasses the autonomous planning and then navigate based on user intention. And finally, the user receives a 3D LiDAR map and a human video, labeled video stream to confirm if the detection is correct or not. And it also knows where the robot is in the map. It is important because if the robot somehow cannot return to the base station, human, if it feels safe, can go in and just grab the robot off. And most importantly, the stranded humans located in the map is also sended so that the rescuers know where to go directly. And this completes our cyber physical architecture. And I'll now pass on to Connie and she'll talk about the project management side. All right, thank you, Andrew. So based on the cyber physical architecture, our project is broken into eight parts. Uh, major steps and algorithms are all um, of each subsystems are all listed here. So 1.1 hardware uh, includes purchasing a live robot, uh, borrowing sensors, and building up the whole system. Um, the next three packages, elevation mapping, uh, state estimator, and planet traverse, are for SLAM. Um, elevation mapping covers the requirement of passing through the un uneven, uneven, uneven ground, and the other two cover the functional requirement of uh, autonomous path planning in narrow places. And the 1.5 human detection, another core, another core uh, function, we will process thermal and depth information to train a neural network to, to achieve this goal. Uh, so 1.6 safety and 1.7 infrastructure cover some uh, non-functional requirements such as uh, failure handling and, uh, um, and visualization interfaces. Last, we will continuously take care of uh, project management tasks. 
So we built, we built work schedule according to the WPS. This is our spring schedule. Uh, in January and in uh, February, we, we plan to complete the build, uh, to complete building the system, get familiar with the unitary robot and, uh, and build software infrastructure. Then we start working on SLAM and human detection. We plan to finish the state estimator by March 20th and then finish elevation mapping by the end of the semester. This is our fall schedule. In the fall semester, we would continue working on SLAM and human detection. We aim to uh, complete the last module of SLAM, uh, which is planned and traversed by the end of October. We will also complete the human detection function at that time. Um, although benchmarks and dependencies have been carefully annotated, there is still inevitable risk uh, associated with each transition. Uh, the first risk is that the unit to robot delivery uh, might get late. Uh, this will heavily impact our schedule. We will begin, uh, we'll begin development using gazebo model of unit to robot. The second risk is that the unit to robot never, never reaches us. The purchase just failed. Uh, in this case, we will switch to the Boston Dynamics spot, spot robot. The consequence is that uh, Spot is super expensive and super popular for researchers, so we couldn't have our, our own robot to play with. Uh, we will work out a scheduling agreement for Spot in the air lab, and we will do uh, major development work in simulation using gazebo, gazebo model of uh, Spot robot. Third, uh, if unitary robot gets damaged somehow when there's an important uh, an important demonstration approaching, we will demonstrate our project in simulation. Uh, we will also work with Unitree, Unitree tech support to fix the robot. Uh, you know, and in the worst case, we will leverage the one year warranty and request another robot to be shipped to us. In addition, there are two risks about the payload. The airlab might be unable to give us the payload on time. Uh, we will plan uh, schedule contingencies for this. The worst case is that the, the, the air lab is unable to give us the payload at all. Uh, this is a bigger risk as we are using up all of our uh, budget over the mobility platform. In this case, we will uh, borrow sensors and, com and a compute unit from other labs, uh, starting with the biorobotics lab. Uh, we will design a CAD model for the frame and 3D print a custom payload for, for the robot. Thank you everyone for your uh, lovely attention. Let me walk you through what you just uh, witnessed over here. We first motivated the use case of why we're doing it, what's the bigger goal of what we're trying to achieve here, and the, the requirements that Edison. Uh, then Zach uh, walked you through again uh, the different options, the phase studies, and why we arrived to the decision, and the, the framework basis for the future decisions we're going to make. We then saw the functional architecture and how it led to site business architecture being presented by uh, Andrew. Uh, ultimately, Connie broke that all of them down into work packages and how we plan to achieve them and milestones, and ultimately risks and how we plan to uh, mitigate them. Uh, that is Team Nightwalkers walking you through our uh, walking robot project for a search and rescue application. Thank you so much. two questions. First one is, when we spoke about your project recently in my office, we, we were thinking at least at that time about the human going into the area, not going to the more dangerous parts of it, but sort of uh, pointing them out to the robot. But I didn't hear any mention of that in this presentation, so you departed from that concept? Yes, uh, I think that question. Uh, so this is a, a slight pivot from our last presentation where we had three clear focuses, which was emission exploration, uh, the uh, low light detection and the human robot interaction collaboration. Now we are focusing completely on the mobility platform, the quadruped, and we still have the same goal. We want to mitigate the risk for the human inside, but we will try to make them maximize the advantage of the mobility platform. And because of the depth of the space, we try to focus completely on this emission exploration. And in the process, we are considering the human detection. The low light and human robot interaction is uh, kind of the, the classic. 
Okay, so there's not a human in, in the uh, space that's being searched by the robot anymore? Uh, there is a human detection, but the low light condition has no, I'm not talking about human detection. There's not a human user in that area anymore. The human user is outside of the yeah, area yeah. and maybe has the teleoperation -op option if needed. Right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then I was wondering about the unit tree. It sounds like a good <coughs> opportunity, and it's inexpensive, but have you seen anything on user forums? Do you know much about its usability and reliability? I'll take this question again. Uh, so um, I have been exploring different uh, labs working on quadruped robots, and I have been uh, uh, working uh, recently with uh, Professor Jack Manchester, who have a unit tree robot. So I have a little bit of uh, hands-on of, of how it is, uh, and it seems reasonable all the project that we are taking over here. Okay. I, I think it's maybe a risk, uh, which you guys probably are aware of, but just, I would say, try to retire as quickly as possible. Maybe spend more time in Zach's lab trying to get the ins and outs so that you have high confidence that it's going to work well for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, good presentation. Uh, I guess uh, one quick question. So, did you guys um, investigate the compatibility of the different um, platforms and specifically now since you're uh, ordering uni uniquely the compatibility of that robot with the air lab payload? Like, have, have you already investigated that? Exactly. Uh, so, in the, 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 the voice I hear from on my end is uh, intermittent, so I, could you help me repeat the question? Sure, I'll repeat the question. Uh, Israel is asking if we have ex investigated the uh, compatibility of LF sensor payload with the different options and uh, especially the unitary option that we're going with. Also, the question is: Is AirLab payload like installable on compatible the with robot? unitary? Yeah. Uh, yes, on the on the unitary robot, they have some uh, mounting, like portable mounting for uh, secondary development, and then that includes you know data ports. And then also uh, power ports, uh, and also the spaces that we can define or print a frame to install a, let's say, additional compute or green lighter on top of the unitary robot. Uh, just adding one small detail to that, uh, they had slightly larger code, larger budget, uh, larger uh, cost, uh, and to provide their own sensors. But we have chosen not to take their sensors and use our own payload. So there are. Uh, to do installees. Okay. Um, and just like maybe one, do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, so in your performance requirements, you had a performance requirements on the um, meter square per time uh, on your exploration. Have you thought about how the complexity of the environment <laughs> is going to affect this time requirement? Because if you have um, the requirement which is very hard to traverse, then it's directly going to affect that performance requirement. So in our project, what we did was, instead of having an absolute requirement on this, we compared two different algorithms um, to actually uh, to actually prove that the system actually works. So have you thought about how your testing environment will affect that performance requirement, or will you design your testing requirements such that your performance requirement is actually feasible? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Interesting uh, point, uh, Vlad mentioned it. Uh, this is a problem that we uh, struggled with multiple stages. The first one was uh, uh, the vagueness of exploration rate. We were initially planning to uh, give an area of exploration and the time associated with it, but we figured it's better to give an exploration rate, which is on average how much area do we wish to cover uh, in, in a given time. So that would include the varying complexities that they can be suffer of, like difficult area that has been traversed, it can be the easy, uh, easy area. And on average, we want to be able to achieve this number. Um, another problem that we have, uh, we have a lot of uh, problems with the performance requirements, the debate itself. How do we uh, make a performance metric out of uh, uh, an untraversable area? Uh, do we say that there is a particular shape? Do we say that there are randomly, we, we are considered saying that there are randomly thrown bricks on the floor and whatever configuration it takes to traverse that. Uh, so this is a sort of like uh, hard uh, performance requirements that challenges we, we face in design, like framing them. Um, so the suggestion that you have said is definitely uh, useful. Uh, along with the ones that we already uh, like, uh, decided, we might even consider adding them. Can, can I discuss offline? Sure. All right, awesome. Thank you.